Hi, I'm here today with Cal Washington of the In Power Movement. Cal's going to be speaking at the Red Pill Expo here in Hartford, Connecticut, June 7th through 9th. And I wanted to speak with him today because I'm only mildly familiar with the 5G controversy and some of the actions being taken. And since Cal is speaking at the Red Pill Conference, I thought I'd take a, you know, a little gander, a little peek behind the scenes, a little preview of what's to come and get to know him before I meet him in person. Cal, how are you doing this morning? Uh, I'm awesome. Thanks, Richard. All right. So how did you come to know uh, G. Edward Griffin and get, uh, get invited to this exciting event called the Red Pill Expo? Uh, it was through Kent Lewis. He um, reached out to us and um, I guess he saw one of the videos or something, got very excited. And so we had a, a couple of calls and then um, he, he introduced um, what we were doing to, to Edward and, and then Edward got on a call with us and, and felt that uh, we were a fit. So that's why we're there. Yeah, I think Kent uh, does some server hosting for ed he does uh, yeah. some it work maybe some video work that sort of thing uh for yeah. live broadcast because I, I know i've had a call with him in prep uh, preparing behind the scenes uh for the red pill expo there's been a lot for uh the pre-production on that it's pretty amazing to see how a big you know corporate conference center can be used to liberate the minds of the audience and to expose them to new new perspectives on things that they might be like again, in my case, mildly familiar with, but there's a lot more detail once you start to dig into it. And I've got to say that, you know, I've, I've, I've been aware of uh, Take Back Your Power. I was actually interviewed for that movie by Josh uh, Del Sol back when he was making it. And there was another interview that we did in our studio for him. It was a local uh, Connecticut expert on electromagnetic radiation. I don't think either of those two interviews made the final cut of the film. But um, I've watched Josh grow over the years and move from the, the, the smart meter issue and the personal issues of, of liability and, and privacy and surveillance and all these sort of things with it. And then I've seen it uh, morph into a much larger comprehensive witnessing of there's a, there's a couple big problems that people are facing. And there are, you know, at that time, they were lacking solutions. So it always feels kind of disempowering to point out the problems and not have the solution yet. How did you come to, uh, to know Josh Del Sol? When did you get involved? How did that all kind of flourish from your personal situation? Well, actually, Josh and I uh, were friends before he did the movie. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't, you know, chronologically, I already knew him. Mm-hmm. And actually, I helped them find an editor and all that stuff. And I was actually interviewed and didn't make the first cut of that movie as well. So uh, there was a lot of footage. But um, anyway, so Josh met me uh, because I went through a, um, a sort of a, an experience with the court system and, you know, and, and all the rabbit holes that go with that. And um, how long was that? How long was your court experience? I would say... Uh, about five years of, you know, pretty much court at least once a month, <laughs> that kind of thing. It was pretty oppressive. And, um, and so I tried a lot of things, um, met a lot of, you know, so-called gurus and tried their methods, you know, the, you know, fighting the name, fighting this and, you know, and free man on the land, all that stuff. I did it all mm -hmm. and took courses and, and, um, and just, you know, I found I was banging my head against the wall until I started doing commerce. And then uh, there was a 180 degree shift from, you know, from my perspective. They started running from me instead of me from them. And um, so it was a trial and error sort of situation. Um, so at the end of all that, I ended up with a very large uh, debt that was published in the, in the public, etc. And so, you know, people kind of uh, were seeking me out to find out, you know, more about it and all that. So Josh was one of those guys who came to my house one time because um, he'd heard of this story about this guy. And then we became friends after that. So that's the and, long version. Yeah. And the, uh, the thing I found interesting was that the layer that you're bringing is it's, it's an extension of your personal experiences plus what you've learned. And now there's a practical application of what you've learned. And it seems like um, uh, the in power movement is eventually going to focus that same technique, that same methodology on three different areas. But can you talk a little bit about, uh, let's talk about the solution and then we'll get to the problem that, that's being solved. 
but the, the simplicity and the elegance of the solution that I see being developed, because it's not by any, you know, uh, it's not done. It's not fully fleshed out. I know it's still in process and growing and you're getting feedback, but um, can you explain the juxtaposition of how you gained this personal experience through court, what you learned that you, know, you were playing by a set of rules and they play by a different set of rules and how you translated that personal experience into a solution that empowers people who learn how to use that solution. It's very simple, it's very effective, and it's very inexpensive. Yeah, so <clears throat> when I first got into court, I had preconceived ideas of what court was, uh, like most of us do. And when I got in there, I, my experience was that's not what's going on in here. And so what is it? And, and so all these questions came up and then I fought for a long time. So it was fighting was my solution. Um, arguing, uh, all those types of things. Once I got into commerce and realized that I can't fight the system, um, like try and get out of it because they just won't recognize it for the most part, I just started to learn how it works. And um, trial and error is still you know, the only way to do anything. Um, I started seeing judges run out of the room and, and judges not wanting to come in the room and cases drop. So you just kind of went, okay, well that's working. And then why is it working? And um, you know, just it's scientific method. What, why did that happen? And then try and figure it out. And one thing leads to another and you get this picture of what's going on and it, it's, it starts to dawn on you. The puzzle pieces start to come into focus and as more puzzle pieces come in, they still fit this picture. So then the picture becomes, okay, this is what's going on. Even though I don't have all the pieces, it's becoming very clear by the pieces that I do have that that's what's, how this works. And therefore, I just started doing that and, and got the results that I was looking for, which was leave me alone. <laughs> And I think, I think it's a, a very effective strategy because it's a very peaceful strategy. It's, it's not confrontational. You're going and using the same system that they're using. So it starts traditionally in this timeline with Take Back Your Power, a movie about smart meters and, and the surveillance and the uh, health issues and things like this. And then the new uh, genre of that is 5G and these networks of microwave stations being put up all around human beings. And uh, we being electromagnetic creatures, our hearts and our minds run on electromagnetic uh, uh, fields. There's an interaction between these two and it hasn't been tested. It hasn't, you know, these things, and they're, they're, they're being done without people's authority. So it started with people trying to fight having a smart meter put on their house. And um, there was the strategy of notice of liability brought in for that. And now that same strategy can be applied to things like 5G and other, other topics of interest. So the, the notice of liability, you and Josh were talking about that when he was making Take Back Your Power, or did that really develop a little bit after that? What's that uh, placement in the timeline? Well, he, he, did the, he did the movie and it was, you know, it had great success and woke a lot of people up. But like you said earlier, uh, well, I'm, you know, I got this, I'm, I've shown the problem, but there's no solution. And so he said, Cal, is there a document you can write that, you know, can then deal with the smart meters? So I thought about it for a bit and I went, yeah, I think we can adapt what I did for this. It's, it's still a commercial process, right? And um, so just so you, just so you're aware, you said that they haven't tested. They have tested this. Um, the smart meters. I meant the smart meters. Yeah, they they've they've also tested 5G. They know exactly what it does. Yeah, uh, you know. So I'm I'm just gonna blurt it out. It's a it's a it's a weapon system, and uh, and I'm not trying to put fear, but you got to get to the truth of the matter. But here's the here's you mean their, that it's derived from military technology used by yeah. defense contractors to and, control um, people. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's definitely a military um, agenda that they're doing, but here's their, here's their Achilles heel. They're doing it commercially. This isn't standing armies from a country wearing uniforms, bringing in weapons. This is Verizon. This is um, Sprint. This is uh, your electric company. They are not armies, therefore you can't, um, you can't approach them in a military way, but you can approach them in a commercial way because they are at the baseline a corporation and therefore fall under corporate law, contracts, etc. So 
that's their Achilles heel is they, they thought they were being clever by doing something uh, military in a commercial way and getting our agreement all the way along because we, we want faster downloads and, and <clears throat> all these things, right? So uh, by and large, uh, the population. So that's how they're able to sneak weapon, uh, weapon system in under the guise of we're agreeing to it, we want it. And, uh, but that is also an Achilles heel for those of us that are awake uh, because we can use commercial process and reverse the contract on them. And so um, because money talks in corporations, it's the blood, um, that's, what, that's the method to use. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, the, since the uh, Union Pacific Railroad Santa Clara County case where they created corporate personhood back in like 1896, corporations in the paper form have no body to incarcerate they have no soul to save so therefore a lot of times those corporate entities in their international form act as psychopaths and there's not a good check and balance on it and they don't care if they're doing things that hurt people because they care about making money so what you're doing is you're going and meeting them where their bloodline is and saying hey this circulation system of money can be called upon through the legal status of what's going on if you know how to uh push the right keys on the keyboard basically right and then the other part is you picked up uh you you uh talked about it being military application technology that is now being put into commercial applications is there a, a reference what's the strongest reference you know off of the top of your head if somebody was skeptical about 5g having any sort of precursor history of military applications that are now being commercialized what can i point them to I would point them to the so-called fires in uh, California. Uh, there's quite a bit, quite a bit of eyewitness um, testimony out there. It's obviously being, you know, scrubbed as it, as it comes out. But um, that was a real test, and the smart meters seem to be a part of it as well, as far as uh, um, targeting. And the uh, the microwave weapons that military uses for crowd control. Uh, is that a similar frequency to the 5G spectrum or uh, how about the, the medical instruments, the classification of these types of frequencies uh, needing a medical license to apply them? Yeah, there well, they're in those ranges where um, you're, you're, you are operating um, in those frequencies where um, it is a medical device and you have to have a license and a, and a, and a degree and all that to, to operate those types of things. So that's why they've deregulated everything, the FCC, and um, they're saying open up the frequencies because um, it's not legal <laughs> to, to operate in those frequencies at this point. So um, they're just saying deregulate, deregulate, just get rid of the laws, right? So that's, that's what they're doing and, and, and they have tested I've got documents here from, from back to the 40s where they, they started testing um, these types of, uh, you know, these types of gadgets and, and they got horrific um, results, a lot of uh, birth defects and instant uh, burns, etc. in the beginning. And over time, they've been able to get it down where it's, um, you know, it's, it's not as um, easy to detect it's more a long-term type of a thing and, you know, um, through our mechanisms and everything. So degenerative disease looks like it's coming on, but it's, um, but it is because they have tested it and they know what they're doing. Well, and I also picked up on, since you brought the F FCC up, there was a guy and, and granted, I've only probably done 24 hours of research on this topic. But there was a guy from the FCC in one of the strongest clips that I saw. Uh, his name is Tom Wheeler. And I believe it was in maybe it was a it was a episode with you and Josh Del Sol. And it was talking about the the critical dangers of 5G. And um, there was a Tom Wheeler clip in there from the FC, FCC speaking at the National Press Club. And he goes and he just explains exactly why they're doing it. And all these things that they're doing that you know they're not asking people's permission for and people aren't really calling for faster down like stuff works fine right now just maintain the network we don't need faster anything especially if it's going to bring in health risk and all these other surveillance aspects or militarized aspects that we also are not calling for um 
it's, it's interesting because uh, it's all going on. Towns are approving this. People are investing big time. 5G is like the next dot-com bubble right? Mm -hmm. It's this next big thing that they're hanging all their hats on. But, and, and then I'm not sure if you're even aware of this point, but the New York times last night published a hit piece on anyone questioning 5g and basically in the headline ties it, it says, uh, uh, no, your 5g cell phone won't hurt you, but Russian, Russian hackers want you to believe it will. And basically the New York times angle. First off, they don't prove the claim. They don't prove that your 5G phone won't hurt you. There's not evidence of anything in that, in that, that I saw. Um, but what they do say is because RT, Russia Today, the news channel sponsored by Russia government, as YouTube will tell you on every time you pull it up, it's sponsored by the Russian government. Uh, because they've covered it, therefore it must be Russian hackers that are promoting you know, anyone questioning 5G, but people question smart meters too. And you should question new technologies because you always lose something as you're gaining functionality from the technology in and of itself. And so there's those aspects. And then there's the increasing aspects that they're, they're short on ideas on how to come up with money. And in the absence of an idea that, you know, brings money without causing health effects, the, those corporations and those entities um, have no concern for you and your family and the people around you. And um, yeah, so I, I'm sorry. I, I, feel like I, I threw too many points out there for you to respond to. So feel free to pick up any one of those and run on, run with it. Well, I'm, you know, surprised that I haven't, I hadn't seen the New York times thing, but. Um, it was actually in the take back your power email thread this morning that Josh sent out. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. That, it's pretty incredible. Uh, uh, where to, where to touch on all that. Uh, how about the military aspects? Uh, you know, FCC is like bridging the gap between these corporations and uh, the government. So the government has, you know, its own military, but then there's all these private defense contractors. So those private defense contractors are working in this technology area and then they bring it out to other pseudo, you know, independent companies like Sprint and Verizon and all these other echelon layers to introduce it. And then the smartphone carriers and everybody's on board and then they're going to be making all these devices that go into that network, right? Um, there's a lot there. And I just see it being done without really the public even being aware, especially since they're not calling for it. They're not, you know, the, the demand is not there. And that's why the pushback right now can be very effective just to say, wait a minute, let's, let's ask some questions here before we go installing these devices that are kind of unnecessary and have a real downside to them. Have we weighed the pros and cons publicly? Has there been a debate? Or do these corporations just act like they own us and they can do what they want to us? And that's, well, a, that's you know. It's, it, it, it goes back to the jurisdiction that I, that I want to talk about, and that's the uh, merchant jurisdiction. So uh, because they've made us all merchants through the birth certificate um, sort of scam, if you want to call it that, um, we we have to abide by merchant law. That's that, that from their point of view of thinking. So if you don't say no, then you've said yes. That's one of the um, customs of, of that system. So, so you're talking about tacit agreement, tacit agreement. So what they, what they do is they have put it out there because everybody's, uh, you know, at least aware of 5g. Um, so it's out there. And because we're not saying no in the proper way, then we've said, yes. so we, we're, we're, we're agreeing to it and obviously there are people who are saying no but they're not saying no in the proper way so they ignore that as well i think the difference though is when you have uh electric you know let's say you had uh what is it bc hydro out yeah. there yeah and they send you a letter saying they're amending their contract they're doing business directly with you with this 5g stuff they're just putting up towers on buildings and hills and they're not even they're not sending us notice right i didn't get a notice in the mail saying 5G is being put all around here. What do you have to say about, you know? No, it, it's um, because they can do it through, um, in their book, you gotta go from their point of view and, and understand how the system works. So they're, they're just putting it out there. It's out in the, in the universe, let's say. There's a, you're aware of 5G, because you just mentioned it. So right. you, you got aware in some way. So you've been told but you haven't said no in the, in the proper way. So I see. So even though they're not they, directly telling me, 
it's because Verizon and Sprint and the news or whoever else is out there touting 5G, telling us how great it is and how it's going to like resurrect business in America. Exactly. So, so that it's, it's that's pretty cool. sneaky. That's pretty sneaky. I didn't. Uh, so it's sneaky that's... until you see it. Then it's, then it's pathetic. <laughs> Because it's like a, it's like watching a three-year-old sitting on your bed under a blanket, thinking, "No, oh, you, you can't see me." Well, no, I can see the, you know, I can see the lump on the bed, and you're moving around, and I can hear you in under that blanket. So it's like it's like that. That's how I view them. Like the, I see exactly what they're doing, and it's pathetic because I can undo that very quickly. I can go, "I agree," until you can prove it's safe, and if you don't, you owe me eight trillion dollars. So that's exactly what they're doing. It's exactly the same thing. All right. So then the question would follow, how do you say no? And to whom do you say no to, to get some traction in this? Here's the thing. They have another uh, system called um, uh, notice the principles, notice the agent. So they have these hierarchy uh, pyramidical uh, systems and they're copied um, on the creation. So there's, there's mathematics and all kinds of things that go along with that. And we don't want to get down that rabbit hole, but anyway, they have a structure. So if you talk to the structure at any point, you are talking to the structure at all points. It, you can't, it's fractal. You can't get, um, one thing can't, one thing always affects the other. They're, they're, they're bound by this. It's like cells they, in, a, in a body, like cells in an organism. Yes. You, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, um, corporate body. Yep. And they've set it up this way in order for, to, to get advantage. That's why, you know, the media, you can break it down to six corporations that own everything. And, and if you go even further, you end up, you know, smaller and smaller uh, groups of beings own everything. Yeah, interlocking boards of directors and that which is above it. Yeah. So if I talk to anything that they've set up, um, and there's a structure, I can talk there and I'm talking to the top. So it's like talking to agents in the matrix. You talk to one, you talk to. So this is, yeah, so this is their system. So you can send it to, you can send it to the installer if you want, but you're talking to the top dog at the same time because it's uh, notice the principles, notice the agent. So that's how you, that's how you do it when you can't know exactly who's behind this and, even what dimension they're in and, and all that stuff. Right. So, so notice the principles. Those are the people in control of the corporation and notice the agent. That's whoever you're interacting with through the corporation yeah. or the, or the entity. Yeah. And that works yeah. with courts and a whole bunch of different commercial entities because they all run on Lex Mercatoria. Right. That's Could you right. Explain, can, can you break that down? Because basically what you're learning is something that's not really taught in law schools. So lawyers don't know about it because they're taught a niche of the law and there's many different types of law and these laws uh, have different, these different types of law have different jurisdictions. There's the, the, the law of the high C there's the civil law, there's common law, right? There's different actions and um, there is criminal law. There's the different factions and layers. So what you're doing is learning about layers that they don't want us to know about. And it is the layers upon which they are operating that you've gone in and say, Oh, I've got the blueprints to their death star. <laughs> and it looks like there's a reactor shaft. There's, right? a, bu- there's a little bus right send, Yeah, if we send a proton torpedo down there, we need some farm boy who's crazy enough to fly down that trench. But if we could do that, you know, so, uh, yeah, start with how did you get into Even the easier than that. They have a yeah. button. There's, there's a button yeah. on the wall that says push this button and you can stop all this. Oh, okay. So it's, so yeah. it's more like space balls. <laughs> So, yeah, it, so it, it, how did you get into Lex Mercatoria? Explain what that is to people and, and then explain why it's so powerful. What's, and it's a tool that individuals can learn how to use and it's not expensive to do. It's, you know, some certified mail over months, you know, going through this process. Just like if you've ever been served with notice, your late payment or notice of whatever, they're putting you through the legal process of taking your stuff, of, you know, uh, yes. reappropriating your car. What do they call it, uh, you know, when they come and pick it up? Repossessing repossessing yeah. right so they so a lot of people have been on the one end of this process but if you learn the process you can get on the other end of it and then interesting things start to happen and yes. people start running for the exit doors not because you're in there being violent but because you've called them on their bs which i think is pretty exactly. interesting 
Yeah, it, it, it really is. And it, like I said, it was trial and error. So the first time we tried something, a judge ran off the bench and you went, you know, we're all standing there. Everybody was standing there. What happened? Like, okay. So I heard this story. Could yeah. you, uh, so you purposely waited to be paged. So you had a court appearance date. You stayed out of the courtroom. So you didn't have to bow to the judge and do all the ceremonial stuff. You're in the hallway waiting to be paged. Cause you know, that's part of their process. So you get paged, you go in the courtroom and then what happens? As we're coming through the door, he's running off the bench as if a gun went off, as if I came in with a gun and was firing it. And you were unarmed with everything. <laughs> All you had was your brain between your ears, right? And your yep. legs walk in there. Yeah. So that's that's not too scary. It. That's not too scary. But a judge, a person in power left as if. Now, did the judge actually think you were armed or were you armed with a certain type of information that might hold him liable as a person in his position of power, right? Yes. So uh, can you explain that to the audience so nobody could like be ambiguous on that circumstance? Uh, well, we put a document in, uh, which was a, what's called a bond. And um, that was the first time we tried it. It was trial and error, not like yeah, we know how this works and all that stuff. It was like, let's try this. Like I tried everything else. And um, that's the result we got. So it, it was like, oh, okay. Why did that happen? And what's, you know, what, so then you, you just go down that rabbit hole. Why did that happen? What's going on? What is this bond? You know, why does it work? Because it was trial and error at that time. We had a little bit of knowledge, but not knowledge I have now. I understand it, but I only understood it because I tried it and saw a result. They blinked. They blinked hard. And um, so I went, okay, they, they're blinking at this. I need to learn more about this. Because up until that time, I was doing all the blinking, all the running, all the hiding, you know, and, and, and you know, the fear sort of not that I was fearful at that time, but, you know, I was on the downside of this relationship, put it that way. And uh, from that day on, I was on the upside of that relationship until they basically gave up and um, they leave me alone now. So uh, that's, that's how this came about. And uh, we just learned and I learned why it worked. And since then I've learned more and it comes down to this ancient, Ancient, and it's ancient, uh, merchant customs, and they're not written laws. It's, it's a custom. It's a way of doing things. And it turns out that it kind of reflects biblical principles. So I had a pretty good Bible knowledge. And as I learned more commerce, I went, well, that sounds like this over here. It's just worded different, but it's the same idea, same principles. And so this, this happened a lot. And so I went, okay, one is copying the other. I don't know which one is which. But um, it, it became overwhelming that um, the commercial process and, and the biblical principles were the identical things said in a different way. So I just learned and learned and learned and, and then some, you know, learned some historical things where they, there was a point in time where they actually moved the Lex Mercatoria into the common law back in England. That's through Lord Mansfield. So it's, a, it's an actual event because they wanted to have that in the, in, the, um, in the common law because everybody was going to the merchant law courts because they were faster and fairer, et cetera. The, the, they were called pie powder courts and then they had uh, certain cities that uh, were called staple cities, like generally ports. And uh, they had a, you know, an actual building where they could uh, do litigation. So litigation had to be fast because the merchants were transient they came for fairs. They had different customs, different laws, different money, different languages. And a lot of them came by boat. So if there was a problem, you had to have it resolved by the next high tide. Because that guy was gone, dude. And you would never see him again. So that's the thing, right? So it was very fast. Like you, you, would, you would get summoned once an hour, not once every three weeks, like the common law was. And if you didn't show up, they summoned you again, summoned you again. They, there was a judgment at noon. So if you started at nine o'clock, you had a judgment by noon. And, and people were going and taking your stuff if you didn't resolve it. So it was very fast and very, um, you know, for the most part, fair. 
And all the merchants understood it and they all liked it. They all like this, this actually works. And um, so it was, it was a, a self-correcting sort of system. So they brought it into the common law and then they didn't tell anybody. So unless you understand, number one, that it's there, let alone how it works, you're going to get killed in commerce because you don't understand how it self-corrects. You're not doing the right processes to, in order to get it to self-correct. So they just keep throwing claims out there, like you said, just put a claim out there. The, the phones are, are safe. They're not going to hurt you. But what I would do is go, okay, I agree with your claim. Upon and I and I would uh, it's a conditional acceptance. I accept your claim upon proof of your claim. So now you have to prove it in an affidavit form. You have to swear to the truth. And if you don't, then you owe me money. So I could make a claim on you right now. I could I could like in the old way. And if you didn't understand what's going on, I could say, Richard, you owe me a million dollars. No, I don't. And I would just go. That's not it. So I'll give you another three days. Richard, you owe me a million dollars. No, I don't. Not, not correct. And I would wait and 30 I would days. Say, I would do some reading and I would say, I accept your claim upon condition that you prove I owe you the $3 million. Yes. And if you can't prove it, then you owe me six. Therefore, I would never try and take advantage of you because I know it's going to double down on me. I think a bunch of people of a specific personality that's really organized just paused this interview to start writing to the New York times to be like, yeah, 5g <laughs> does, phone doesn't hurt me. I accept your claim. I would like proof. And if not, you're going to end up paying me because yeah, you have to be creative in that way. But yeah, because they're, they're out in the public like that. Um, and you pay for the newspaper, et cetera. So you, you know, you got, you got to, there's always the a way to, cost of their propaganda they're propagandizing if people understand the system one could easily do that in fact many people could easily do that and then yes. that would really make them think about publishing propaganda when they are not providing proof exactly and that's what lex mercatory was like it was self-correcting you couldn't take advantage of somebody because it would double back on you but all the merchants knew the rules that's how it worked, but because they slipped it in and then didn't tell anybody and then made us merchants through the birth certificate, turned us all into corporations, therefore Lex Mercatory applies to you and it's in the common law, you know, way back in the 1600s, you know, nobody knows about that, but it's, it's a fact. And um, therefore we can treat you in this way where we can just make claims and you owe, me, you owe me a bunch of money, you owe me taxes, you owe me this, you owe me that. Really? That's interesting because again, it fits the metaphor of there's a, there's a board, it's got black and red squares on it. We're taught that it's a checkers board, but really they're using it to play chess and yes. observing that we should learn to play go, which is to gain the most territory in the shortest amount of time. <laughs> okay. We got to catch up, right? Well, this is the thing, right? So, uh, you know, there's, yeah. And there's, a, there's another game where you just take your arm and wipe the whole thing off. So uh, I walk away from the table. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's all about your understanding of how reality works and, and uh, it's an inner thing. So, you know, you're dealing with your own stuff and you got to start there and because we're all part of the problem and part of the solution, all of us. And um, so, you know, you got to deal with your own stuff and then learn how certain systems, certain jurisdictions work and operate in them. So we're trying to get people to operate above statutory, above the idea of countries. Um, money is still involved because it's a merchant system, but um, up into that, le that level of playing at that, um, in that jurisdiction, what they've made you become anyway. So just learn how to do it and you'll get different results than, than what you've been experiencing. And I think, I don't know. There was a time because I learned about free man on the land, that sort of stuff like 10 years ago from the guys that were teaching it up in uh, Canada, Robin Lard and those guys. I learned about it through like videos on YouTube and these sort of things. 
And uh, I never saw anyone like effectively implementing, but it was interesting ideas, learning about these, these structures that are ancient and still remaining in place today and how one can leverage these sort of things. And I thought that was interesting. And then, you know, uh, got into uh, the, the, the 5G, understanding this angle and where you're coming from. And I know a couple other people that are big fans of yours and they've been talking you up. So it was, a, it was a pleasure to have the excuse to make it in my schedule to be like, all right, I'm going to really dig deep on Cal's, uh, Cal's experience. I also want to talk about uh, the, the time you were driving without driver's license. But before we get to that, um, the, the, the notion had been coming, uh, it's becoming more and more prevalent. So just most recently, I have a student in my autonomy course who's, who's now a good friend of mine. His name is Michael Badnerick. He ran for president back in 2004 on the libertarian platform. I don't think he's now part of the libertarian political system at all anymore. His ideas are much more advanced after having that experience. But uh, he's also somebody who hasn't had a driver's license in like, I don't know, probably 20 years. And he's very knowledgeable on these aspects of law and uh, I think you guys would have a really interesting conversation and you will have the opportunity as he's also a speaker at the Red Pill Expo and he'll be oh, here cool. in Hartford. So we'll get a chance to all sit down and like have a little round table talking about these aspects because uh, it's simple forms of knowledge that once, once you point them out, like you said, once you point it out, it's all over the place and now you're interacting as a merchant instead of uh, somebody who's, you know, you're, you're interacting as somebody playing chess instead of playing checkers. Yes, right? and it's scary because one of the tenets of commerce is truth is, um, is superior in, in commerce. Like, I'm using the wrong, ter um, wrong term, but the truth, uh, and the truth it has to be an affidavit form. That's the, that's the part that people miss. You can blurt out stuff all you want, but. It, you have to actually swear to it. And um, that's the key. So you have to get them to prove something in affidavit form. So what I found was, as I was going, you know, as I learned more of this and I was doing things, I always won because guess what? They're always lying. So. It, and they're just comfortable with it because nobody's calling them on it. And <laughs> that's right, because because you, you didn't become more powerful overnight than uh, any of these organizations. It's because it's the same lever, but you moved the fulcrum, right? And this goes back to Archimedes principle, another ancient principle of leverage and learning is how you move the fulcrum, right? So it's the same lever. It's just, you know, they're over there and over, you're over here, but you're moving the fulcrum back and forth. That gives you more leverage, that, that learning process that you did, right? And now what we're talking about is uh, New York Times makes this claim you send a letter to the principal, you send a letter to the agent, you ask for an affidavit saying, I, I believe your claim, and I would like an affidavit for you guys to stand behind your claim. You're the New York Times, right? And then that starts people thinking on the other end about what they're printing in their newspaper, right? Yeah, because the more people that understand how it really works, that cl I'll tell you this, claim is the strongest word in law, according to the, to the Black's Law um, Dictionary because I looked up the word demand and it said it's the second strongest word next to claim. So uh, d um, The strongest position in man's law that you can be in is making a demand based on a claim So but the claim doesn't have to be true. That's the that's the problem And so what do you, what do you mean by that the claim doesn't have to be true the claim like you so can people, make, like I said I can I can just claim that you owe me a million dollars but it right. doesn't have to be true but I can inf actually enforce that in Lex Mercatoria because you didn't respond it's it's a it's a funny thing and it sounds really weird but when you when you see it it makes sense if everybody understands that's how it works, I would never make a false claim against another merchant who understood the rules. I would just, I would, you know. And that's what you mean by it being self-correcting, right? That's correct. Yeah. So what they're doing is because everybody is in ignorance of where the, how the game is being played, they can just put claims out there and just say, you owe me income tax. And then when people go, where's the law? There isn't one. They're just making a claim. Right. So um, you mentioned Black's Law Dictionary. Does that does the definitions as uh, listed in Black's Law Dictionary pl uh, apply to Lex Mercatoria? I'm just saying in man's law, claim is, is a strong thing. Yeah. So, yes, claims are um, 
are the, are the biggest thing um, on this thing, whatever, whatever this matrix thing we're on here. Claiming is how things are, um, how they get authority, how they get anything. Right. But there are rules. And according to the Bible in the, in the, like in the very first couple chapters, a being named Adam was put here, created here, whatever, however you look at it, it doesn't matter. But the creator breathed into him, put himself in that being in a forgetful state, but gave him dominion. That's the contract. That's the underlying um, truth of the matter. And we lost it. And we, but not really, we just think we've lost it because other people came in and said, no, I think I have authority. Nobody's saying, no, okay, well then I do. And if you challenge it, uh, off with your head. And that's how it starts. It's, it's that, it's that fragile, dude. I'm telling you that it's, um, their structures are, are imposing looking and they've been around a lot for eons, but they're extremely fragile. It's a house yeah, of they're cards. They're based on the fallacy of authority. It's right? all based on, on fictitious assumptions that we've all bought into. And, you know, even the idea of countries, you know, we, we got to get to these fundamental levels. What is a country? How did it get here? Why are, why are you in the United States and why am I in Canada? The birds and the animals don't seem to recognize it. They just, like, it's not there. It's, it, but we've been told it and we, you know, we have flags and we have songs that we sing and we have this sports events every four years and we put on our colors and we yell like crazy and, um, you know, and sing these songs because we're this, but we're not. It's all, think, it's all fictitious. You know, it's, all, it's all been put in our heads. Easily recognizable parcels to be managed. And they have different management styles for different parcels of land. And they can, and they can make one parcel of group of people hate the other parcel of group. Yeah, it's necessary to dehumanize people before you can ask your people to go to war with them. I mean... This is all taught. This was all taught to us, and there's books on it, and you know, like there's stor ancient stories. Uh, we we're not naturally warring species. We're well, I, I think that there's a lot of energy that goes into creating the divide and conquer mentality that brings about the ever ongoing conflict. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, when we were talking about Black's Law Dictionary, you know. I, I got into it. I have several different editions here in my library of that dictionary to see how legal terms have changed over time. And I first, I, I didn't really appreciate the law from going to high school. I didn't appreciate it from going to university. But once I became a federal whistleblower and started representing myself pro se, I had a big learning curve to, to you know, be able to maintain myself through that situation. Mine took like six years. That's why I was asking how long your legal process went. It's a good, uh, it's, uh, I call it my million dollar education because that's basically what it cost me to go through and, you know, sacrifice other opportunities in order to be a pro se litigant against a multi-billion dollar corporation. Yeah. I learned many of the same things that, that you learned. And that's why I'm interested to see like how, the, how these ideas and this, this moving the fulcrum actually translates to the power of the lever. And that is through uh, these various types of letters that can be written once you understand the various layers of uh, law and jurisdiction and the ways that you can interact with these other people making claims against you or sending you options to, to change your contract that you just don't even recognize as an opportunity to say no. And I think no is one of the most powerful words in our language and people should learn how to say it correctly in these proper situations, uh, situations that properly call for it, where it's not in our best interest to capitulate our conscience just to go with uh, the orders. And yeah. to, you know, but you don't okay. want to say no. You want to say yes, if, or yes, but. I, I appreciate that. See, because I, uh, it's the thought of, resistance but what you're saying is just like anything else when somebody disagrees with you or what have you you want to agree and then move forward from that with the disagreement right yes. so what you're saying is you have to say yes but i'm going to need these documents like i'll accept your claim that sounds very interesting I'll, and i'll accept it but i'm going to need this this right. is how I 
Yeah. So it's it's a and, a, and, a, and in the Bible, it's called settle with your brother on the way to court. It's the same principle. So it's 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 not a uh, confrontational. You want to try and actually settle things. So you want to do a conditional uh, conditional acceptance is the is the key to this. And part of a contract um, is an unconditional acceptance. So, so the minute you have a condition on it, the condition has to be met in order for the contract to go forward. So you put a condition on it. Just like when you bought a house or, a, you know, there was conditions, um, uh, subjects, whatever you want to call them, right? So once those subjects are removed, then the deal actually can go through. So that's all it is, is it, I accept your offer um, on these conditions. Uh, and if you don't meet these conditions, then the contract now becomes this. Right. And that's your counter offer. Because they started, they're initiating the process by saying, we want to update your existing contract. That's and correct. You, right. So, so because, because they put the offer out there, they started it, you get a chance to, in, in the, what's called the meeting of the minds, to put in your counter offer. So you accept their offer. And if you don't like it, just say, I, you know, I'll accept it if you can prove it's safe or whatever it is. Like, you, there's, it's very creative, right? So, um, and if you don't, then this is now the new contract. Do, you have an, do we have an agreement? And if you go silent, just like you told, you know, just like you were doing to me a, a second ago, if you go silent, then you've agreed to all these terms. Yeah, and they're not expecting that. They're not expecting people to... Oh. To, to take a PDF to amend it with their own name and situation, and then to send that off with a couple stamps. They're not, and they're not prepared to deal with it. And, um, you know, I heard the one call from a whistleblower inside one of those companies and he's like, they've got a war room. They're, they're putting your faces up on the board. They're tracking down and like trying to figure out who you guys are. And, and it's, um, I mean, of course they are. That yeah. sounded like a totally legitimate whistleblower. It's like, yep, that's what it sounds like, you know? So uh, they are trying to scramble because they've set expectations of investors. This is the dangerous part. The investment market was totally behind this before the public was even notified and all that money moved. And now those people are seeking to protect their investments. So they don't even care if it's the right thing to do. They already put their money there and that's how they make decisions, unfortunately. It's one of the yeah. problems with money is it that's magnetizes right. so, people to do ill things. Yeah, so you want to use the money as it's the game piece, it's the blood, it's the currency, it's the you know, it's the current, it's the um, the blood flow, it's the it's how that whole thing it's controlled works. Controlled by the banks. Yeah. Yeah, it's all it's all and again, money is one of these fictitious things. It doesn't really exist. You know, one of the things I always say is the um, we're the only it's tacit agreement. That's another example of tacit agreement. That's how money works. We agree that this money's worth something. We're the only living species, plant, animal, or whatever that pays to live here. We're the only ones that get birth and death certificates, you know, if two, because the squirrels don't get those. <laughs> no. And if you ask the question why, or I asked the question once upon a time, like, uh, did George Washington have a marriage license? Like, you know, like where did the state, because when people get divorced, you see the state get involved. And I'm like, how did the state get involved? Oh, the marriage license. Why do you need a license to get married? Like, so I had, uh, I had been encountering and started, you know, my wheel started turning once I, once I found out the, like the map I had did not match the terrain. The map that schooling gave me, university gave me, did not match the terrain. And then like you, I was seeking to like, okay, so where is the map of this terrain? Because people have been running around this place for a couple thousand years. Who knows how this is working? Right. right? What, how are the court systems in particular? That was my beef. Um, how are the court systems actually working? Who do they serve? What are these places? What is the history and evolution of these institutions? And that's where I got a real education. But that yeah. was not in um, school. Was in and when you, when you, yeah, when you can see it and it – uh, removes number one the fear and and number two you know what to do you know you, until you until you can assess the truth of the matter of the situation you can't you don't know what to do you do you end up doing the wrong thing and, and you'll be in fear that's brilliant because you associated those two because the antidote for fear is learning and so you the result is you'll be without fear and you'll know what to do it's wonderful yeah, it, it my life my life went 180 degrees. You know, there was a a period of you know change, um, maybe about a year. Um, but 
it definitely changed. And, you know, it's been years where, you know, now I come across a police officer and it's, you know, these aren't, these aren't the droids you're looking for. It's that, it's that, it's all that kind of stuff, you know, from Star Wars. It's like, did that just happen? You know, and I don't have a driver's license, so it never yeah, goes. There's a methodology. There's a methodology because in order for them to go out there and, and act as peace officers or public servants or law enforcement, they're not enforcing laws they're enfo- enforcing codes and regulations and acts. Policy. And without certain paperwork that's stamped and sealed and that they don't even carry on them, they're kind of impersonating somebody because they don't have their papers with them to prove it. So how do you know, right? There's all these layers. And if you know about those layers, it's like, oh, I'm interacting with another person who's wearing a costume and carrying deadly force. So I should be very polite, very calm, very cool, not provocative and and have empathy for them, but still defend yourself using intellectual self-defense techniques, which, you know, uh, is popularized by the the notion of a Jedi mind trick. (laughs) That's true. uh, But it's to the stage in my life now where, I'm going through a roadblock and, you know, for, for drinking driving. So they're, they're stopping everybody. I don't have a license. It never goes that far. It's like. So can you roll, can, can we role play that for just for the audience? So they would have an idea. Cause that sounds so far out of left field. And I look forward to you and Michael Badnerick having these discussions because I've heard some of his, like how he's talk, walked and, walked and talked through those situations right so uh i pull you over uh sir we're doing a drinking and driving uh check tonight have you been drinking where are you coming from yeah he that was his question where are you coming from i said downtown downtown that, where were you going downtown that was the only question tonight <laughs> he didn't ask that so what did so, he do next what happened then he said um look at my gla- he was wearing glasses he said look at the corner of my glasses and so i thought okay well I, i'm gonna have well, obviously this is a concentration thing or something. I don't know what it is. So I just looked at his glasses and he took a light. I didn't actually look at it because I was looking at his glasses and he brought it over sort of in front of my face. Okay, have a good evening. That was it? No license, no ask if I was drinking, no nothing. And um, I'm wondering, like, is it just a focal point on the corner of his glasses? He wanted you to look there so he could do the thing with the light. Or or do they have Google Glass where they're doing retina scans for identification? I don't know. Because they will at some point. Yeah. (laughs) That's what they're developing. Uh, I don't know. So so I asked a buddy if he'd heard of this before. Because, you know, know, I'm, I'm, I'm at an age where I've seen a lot of different sobriety tests, you know, in my lifetime or heard about them at least you know, walking the line and touching your nose, all that, you know, over the, over the period of time it's changed. And um, so this was something I'd never experienced before. I don't know what it was. And I was wondering the same thing. Like, are they, does the light somehow do something to my eyes? Like, I, I, I don't know what it was. Cause I didn't look at the light itself, what he had in his hand. I, I, you know, I just followed the instructions. You were obedient and you were let go. So what about a time when yes. you get pulled over and they say license and registration and you don't have a license? How do they know that you can operate the car? How do they validate your identity? How do they do business with you? Because you got to sign some stuff, right? That's part of the bills of lading and all the other things that go on with the, if you become a, a, a customer of theirs and they put you in a cage, they're going to have to sign a bunch of receipts and trade you around because you're a parcel now, right? And store you in a place. <laughs> I've been through all that and I, and I refused to sign. And uh, there was, they, you know, they had, they had a, um, you know, mind melt down with that. But, you know, I, I tried to convince them. I said, you know, my signature is unique, obviously, and you want it. But there's no way that you can actually force me to do it. Like, you can't make my hand make my signature. So stop all the bravado. Like, you can't make me do it. And they need you to participate because that's part of the system, right? So now you're throwing a wrench in there. If you don't go sign in the paperwork, how can they process you? They can't get paid. Here's the thing. It's, it, How's it work? Explain it. I don't know if you know my whole story, but I did 60 days in jail pending a trial, right? They held me without bail to get me through a one-day trial, and it took them two months because I kept catching them and stuff. But regardless of all that, throughout that whole process, I signed nothing. I accepted nothing. I even had to go 
I ended up with strep throat in there because it's a dirty place. And I, you know, I'd never really been in there before. And it started because you didn't have your license. So you got, you got pulled over, you didn't have a license and they put you in jail waiting for your trial because you didn't have a license, right? They didn't care about the license so much. It was the insurance. Mm. That's definitely a commercial thing. Definitely. Well, because I had found in their act, like I was like you, I went through the acts and I, you know, I read and I argued and I had really good arguments throughout all my, you know, the beginning. How'd that work out? No, yeah, well, you know how it works out. (laughs) I do. (laughs) So even though you have the better argument, yeah, you lose. And now I see why, but um, I didn't then. And so I found in their act that I could put in a, uh, I could do what was called, we have commercial, we have uh, universal insurance here. And I imagine you might have it there by now, but it started here. It was one of the first things and now every state in North America does it. But so you can only buy insurance at one spot and um, the government owns that, of course. Um, So that's another story. But so anyway, in the act, they had to allow for a man to actually interact. So you were allowed to take financial responsibility. And if Mm. you put an instrument with the finance minister, they would give you this sticker for your window and a card saying you took financial responsibility for your driving. So we did it. They didn't accept it. The finance minister ended up stepping down and she was being groomed to be the next premier. So it was a big kerfuffle. And so I drove with this instrument for over two years and they took the plates and, and I made my own plates and they took those twice. And, you know, so then I rode around with a big black hole on a white van for, you know, and I got pulled over about once a month. And I, I, mean, I knew from their act that um, I could be towed to their impound or I could be towed to a private property. So I chose a private property. Oh yeah, it's my buddy. He lives right there in that driveway, right? What a coincidence, he lives right there. So every, every time I got pulled over, the tow truck would come. And uh, as soon as the car was on the tow truck, the police officer would leave and I'd give the tow truck driver his $74.83 because it was a fixed amount. And he put my car down and I'd drive away. And so there was nothing they could do about it. And they knew I was doing this. <laughs> and I did it for a long time. <laughs> so then they summons me to court. And I, I did a, a process on that. And I said, yeah, as long as you can prove that you are, you're actually a court and that there is a country here and all that stuff. And they, you know, so they, they came and arrested me at work and held me without bail because they knew I wouldn't show up, you know, because I'm, why would I? You guys have no, you can't prove any authority. You have no, there's no basis to, like you said, what, what is this court? It looks like a corporation to me. <coughs> and even our country is a corporation and, you know, there's a bunch of issues with Canada as well. So um, huge, gaping I- issues. And um, so I said, you know, if you can prove that you have this authority, then I'll, I'll show up, but otherwise I'm not. So they held me without bail because they knew for that. So in that 60 days, I signed nothing. And the sheriffs would come and take me to, you know, to court you know, once a week or whatever it was. And um, you had to sign in order to to get it in the van. I'm, well, I'm not signing that. Well, then you can't go. I was like, okay, put me back in my cell. I don't care. You think I want to go to court? No, I don't. You are forcing me to go and now you want me to sign something, but I'm not signing. So I signed nothing. I wouldn't take their phone card. So I had no access to phone. I took no benefits um, other than food and the, you know shower and soap and stuff. So I couldn't buy chips. I had money and you know, they, they caught me with 300 bucks and I could have opened an account, but again, I would have to sign something so I could get extra, you know, niceties. I could have lived better, but I, I chose not to sign anything, including going to the infirmary. So I had to deal with strep throat and couldn't eat for about a week and all that stuff. So I toughed it out. And when they finally let me go, it, the, the tr- my trial was done and everything was done about 10 o'clock in the morning. It wasn't until about eight o'clock that night that I was actually let go. My buddies were waiting to take me out for a steak and all that. And they waited all day because by the time they gathered up all the paper of all the money they're going to make, there wasn't any. Right. Can you explain that part? All the paper with your signatures can be turned into money. How? 
because my signature is um, in the Bills of Exchange Act, just, just so you know, the, a blank piece of paper with a signature on it with no evidence um, contrary to anything, like with no other things on it, can be turned into a bill of exchange. And a bill of exchange is defined as money. So your signature is money in their system. Every time you sign something, they're monetizing. I can guarantee it. So I, there was no proof. They, like, if, if I was let go, there was no proof that I was ever there. I didn't take the I didn't take the phone card with my picture on it. Like they would have a hard time saying, "Yeah, we had this inmate here for sixty days, and we need to get paid." What inmate? Uh, well, this you know this guy. Well, where's the paperwork? We got none. He signed nothing. Everybody just signs stuff, right? So I signed nothing, and there was no proof that I was there. So they monetize, like you said, they they warehouse you. So they, you're, they get paid for inmates. That's why they keep the jails full because it's a it's business. It's the same as a kennel. You got to pay for storage. You got to pay for grooming. You got to pay for food. Like there's bills for all that you gotta stuff. You got to pay for, there are, pe there are inmates in the United States who are on constantly being moved from one jail to the other all across the United States because of the transport money that's just transporting a, a, a prisoner is, is huge money. So they literally keep them in a truck just shipping packages getting paid taking those uh people for what do they call it um Channel. there was a term for it where they would uh, basically torture people during those those prison rides uh i forget what the term was but you know transferring prisoners and then taking extra long routes and suspicious things going on and then the prisoners showing up beat up and things like this so there's like multiple layers of things being done that are ill in that system it's it's putrid the amount of, you know, guys that were brought into this, this is like, um, it's called like remand. So you're in a, you're in a place that is pretty locked down. It's not like day jail. It's like, you know, there's people on murder charges and, and every other charge, anybody that's pending trial or in a trial situation is in this place. So it's, it's not pleasant. There's some, you know, unsavory types there. But the amount of, there was one guy that was brought in because he stole a chocolate bar. Like you're bringing a, a guy into a pretty dangerous situation because he took a chocolate bar? And, and the amount of guys- But they can make money. They can make money off of him. That's what, right? the, they just need to keep the jails full. So the jails are constantly full. So it, once one guy goes, they go and get another guy off the street for whatever. They don't even care. They just get a body in here. We need this place full. and. Um, and, and the amount of guys that, you know, that, that have drug problems and, and, you know, esteem problems and, and that kind of thing, they all kind of live in a, in a congregated area, you know, inner city sort of area. And so they'll let these guys go because their, their charges are, are, you know, silly. And, um, but they'll put a condition on it that you can't go into this certain block and they know darn well they're going to go in there because that's where all their friends and that's where they're that's where they live so they instantly go yeah we'll let you go within a week they're back in it's and they just keep cycling these guys it's like entrapment but they tell you about the trap ahead of time and that's part of their modus operandi and you agree to it because in order for you to get out you have to sign that agreement i will not go into that thing so there's the contract boom gotcha it's that signature and they're in and out, in and out, in and out, same guys all the time. And uh, it's just this vicious circle, and, and, but they're making money off of it. So at the end of your 60 days, you got your day trial. And um, during, that, you're, you're, during that time, your friends had submitted a, a promissory note, if my memory serves. And uh, that came up during the trial. Cause, so could you explain to people? So we, we talked about how you got in, things that went on. And now uh, on your way to trial, getting out of there, how does that situation resolve? How did that promissory note come in? And what was admitted during that exchange you had with the judge? Okay, well, the promissory note was put in early, uh, within days. When it looked like it was going to be longer, because they picked me up on a Friday, and normally they'll hold you like a weekend. Normally it's 24 hours, but they'll, sometimes they'll hold you a weekend if they can, just mm -hmm. to 
yeah, to make your life uncomfortable. So when it kind of went past that, that's when I think the guys thought we need to, you know, do something to get them out. So they put this note in and it disappeared out of the file because they kept checking the file <clears throat> to see we'd catch them on all kinds of frauds. And then I would blurt it out in court. <coughs> and the so promissory like, note, it was an offer to pay. They're like, they're looking for money. They're looking for so our guy friends. Yeah. Friends were yeah, paying so to let, let their guy go. Yeah. So all the things that we just talked about, <clears throat> whatever you think you're going to make off this guy, I'm sure it's not this amount. And here you go. Let our guy go. So they took it like it was gone from the file. So they accepted it. It was stamped by the court. And um, so on, on the last day, when I got my sentence, um, she, she, she found me guilty and was, you know, staring at me and glaring and all that stuff, which was typical, <coughs> guilty of driving without insurance. Just so everybody knows, I'm not, a, it wasn't a criminal charge or anything like that. Some people get funny about stuff, you know, about being in jail, but anyway, so she gave me one day in jail is my sentence, a five year driving prohibition. I didn't have a license anyway. And, and um, a $1,200 fine. And, and 59, 59 days. Yeah. 59 days credit. That 59 was 59 days credit. So that's my sentence. So, so I went, well, I'm not accepting the five year driving prohibition. I said, it's going to cause me harm. I'm not accepting it. Because I knew what they were going to do. The minute I accept that, my life is going to be this continual because I'm breaking that contract, you see. So I went, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going for that. I'm not going to try and dodge you guys for five years. You, you will pick me up. I know you will. They're, 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 they got clever ways of doing it. So I'm not going through this cycle that I had watched in jail, right? So I learned a few things in there. So she drops it. And the prosecutor is like, she just, yep, off. And so I'm negotiating with her, right? So I said, okay, now I want to talk about this 59 days credit. And she's like, yeah. So I said, the 59 days credit that you just offered me has to equal the amount of a promissory note that was put in by my friends. What? I said, a promissory note was put in by my friend. She goes, what? I said, a promissory note. And then she, you know, on the third time, she kind of go, okay, where was it put? I said, it was put um, at 222 Main. I, it says, I don't know where I am. Am I coming through the basement? I knew where I was, but I was just acting. So I said, I don't even know where I am because I come in a truck and I don't, you know, she goes, yeah, you're at 222 Main. I said, uh, well, that's where they put it. And where did they put it there? I said, with the clerk of the court. She goes, okay. So I said, uh, the promissory note or the, the offer you just gave me has to reflect the promissory note. And so she says, well, how much was the promissory note? And I said, $300 million. And she, you know, like, mm. and I could hear all the lawyers cause they were all were interested in my case. They were all in the back and they were, you know, there was a bunch of kerfuffle back there when I said that. And so that was the end of it. And um, so that's how that came about. So once I got out, we tried to collect the 300 million, of course. And we tried a couple of different ways. Again, still trial and error. She said you were entitled to it, right? Before she knew the amount, she said you were entitled to she it. She said, yes. Yeah, she said, yes, okay. How much was it? She wasn't expecting that. So I think she knew about it because I can't see why she wouldn't. They would have um, at least warned her, but maybe she didn't. She was the newest judge in British Columbia. She'd only been a judge a month. <laughs> she was from a, you know, another borough of where I live, like Richmond, and they brought her specifically, like, you got to take that trial. She was the bottom of the rung, so you get that one, because nobody wanted it. By that time, you know, people were, had heard and seen some stuff, and judges were like, no, nah, no, nah, that's too much for me. I'm not, I'm not participating. And so she got it. And she went through the trial and she did what she was told, find me guilty, all that stuff. And I had some pretty compelling evidence, you know, like as far as the trial goes, again, as we talked, I won the trial anyway, but I lost. 
you know, the police officer was a, um, I don't want to say it, but he, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer. So, and of course I had lots of time to come up with questions. So I had five pages of, of questions for him and, uh, he kept answering the same thing over and over. I don't recall, I don't recall, I don't recall, which was about 400 times. <laughs> the prosecutor had his head on the desk, like, say something else. I don't recall, I don't recall, I don't recall, I don't recall. He was like, obviously the prosecutor had coached him, all you gotta do is say, I don't recall, but you know, and, and, it's, and it's all good. Like, yeah, it's simple. <laughs> that will work, work if it's two or three questions, but not four or five pages of them, right? Right. That's all. He, that's basically his answer is I don't recall. But is that the guy? Oh yeah, that's the guy. Oh yeah, well, geez. kind of selective memory there. And uh, since I'm the only uh, black person in the room and I'm wearing a red suit, uh, you know, on and on and on. He wrote down my name wrong, and I asked him, you know, point blank, did you write it down exactly as you saw it on the passport? Yes. Are you sure? Yes, exactly as you saw it on the passport. Yep. Wrong name. All that stuff. So I won the case, but I lost, right? So so anyway, this is how this is where it went. It went into this commercial thing. So then we um we we tried a couple of things. Um they ignored it. And then we found a document and modified it. We spent a long time on it, um, like two or three months, maybe even longer learning every word we looked up you know uh, we don't make assumptions when i read a sentence if there's one word there that i think i know what it is i go no i need to know what that is and i would spend the time and look it up look it up in a dictionary look it up in a law dictionary find out all the definitions of that word so that the sentence takes on new meaning depending on how you define that word and that's how you learn and that's how i learned how to read their acts and all that so it's it's it, there's a diligent that um you have to go through in order to really get on top of this. But um, so that's what we did. We came up with this document. I mailed it in on a Thursday morning. I had my buddy at work um, take me to the mailbox. Um, you know, I told him vaguely what it was. He, he had some idea, but on Monday morning, that same guy went, Cal, it's in the newspaper. The exact amount that you told me that you were asking for is in the newspaper. The government's admitting they owe this money. And so <clears throat> one thing led to another, and then on the talk shows and all this stuff, they, they were admitting to it. And um, weren't saying what it was, but they were admitting that this debt somehow appeared out of nowhere and it was substantial. So, um, so we, we knew we were on the right track. And so that document, is what I modified for the smart meters and the 5G and the, and the uh, vaccinations. All right, so now that's getting to uh, the in power movement and uh, take back your power was Josh Del Sol's vehicle. And then you and he, uh, was he involved in the, in the creation of it or the inspiration of it? But I know you guys continue to work on these topics together. Your site is the inpowermovement.com or is it .org? .com. So yeah, so Josh, asked me because he'd heard about this whole story <clears throat> and we'd become friends um, since then. So, you know, this is a number of years. And um, uh, he asked if I could write something on that. So I took that, I went and dug that old document up and um, modified it for, for smart meters. And it, and it took a long time. Like it, it takes more than a month to do one of these. It's, it's, it's not, as easy as it looks. <laughs> and um, so we did that and we tried it out in Seattle. So I, um, he says, can you come down here? Cause I, I wrote him the document. And I said, here, here, there you go. Your friend fly at it. I didn't really, it wasn't, that was my involvement. I thought that's all I had to do. And um, so he said, can you come down and talk about it? Cause I have this group. I said, I'm not a public speaker. Like I'm not, I'm not that guy. <clears throat> and um, so I went down there. Turns out I am a public speaker because people got fired up for whatever reason. And they, um, all 20 of the people are, there's about 40 people in the room, but about 20 of them 
want to do it right right away like bing uh, that's it like they 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 got it and um so we we went through the process and we saw you know city councilors stepping down they have a um a city run utility there so the councilors are over the ones that were getting it and we saw two mayors step down there so i went no nah, looks like pretty much what i saw in my life same sort of thing upper people vanishing so yeah it's working and so then we did detroit and same thing again um upper people making behavioral changes and um job changes and and that kind of thing so um we know it, that it's getting the results that i got and we just need to do it in a more you know, massive scale so going forward we went on dr mercola's site and um, did an interview similar to this and we got inundated like we got overrun by people and um we couldn't answer all the inquiries we had no mechanisms for it we weren't weren't expecting anything like that and it, so it was overwhelming so we had to kind of almost shut down and that's why a lot of people think we've gone away but we've actually um we need to be prepared um to be able to handle the influx of people and and get them in and involved and um operating the documents properly and learning and all that stuff so that's <clears throat> what we're expecting to happen at red pill is this same thing that happened at dr mercola it will be um the the spread will be will be quite big and the influx will be there so we're, we're frantically not frantically we're um, diligently planning to be able to in in um import all these people and get them all plugged in and and um operating all right. Well, that's good. Cause the next thing I wanted to bring up was when I was on your website, it's a great website. It looks like it's mobile friendly, has the essential knowledge and content that you need on there. What I saw missing was um, a, a single call to action that trades a nugget of knowledge. Let's say some sort of worksheet cheat sheet on uh, 5G on uh, the solution to it, the best practices, the pro tips, these sort of thing. That would allow you to have direct communication with people who are interested. It would empower them with a couple tools that they can use, print out or leverage however you see fit. And um, you know you have a lot of choice on that. And then you could have a course offering and then you can offer that to your mailing list and that helps people actually step-by-step step go through and then learn the stories of other people in the class as they share information back and forth. You can develop effective strategies quicker and you'd uh, not have a repeat of what you guys have with the overwhelming response. You'd be exactly. able to so, so leverage we, the, the red pill interest. Yeah. So we, 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 we have an LMS, <clears throat> which does all that. So it has a little bit of AI where just like you said, as people put input in and more and, and people are attracted to that or reacting to it, it moves it up in the echelon. So you, you can kind of create this um, organic learning mechanism where everybody can learn from each other and um, and get to the you know to the truth and and have a one um, mind and then we can do one you know concerted actions as well you know in a large group when you if you have a large enough group that you know there's not much they can do about it if we all just go and change our meters what are they going to do if we all you know if we have a large enough group the 5g is a joke because uh, apparently it doesn't work unless things are close together so you only got to take out every second one you're talking about the repeaters that are necessary because it's such a highly concentrated type of energy. It doesn't go very far. And so they need repeaters every so many meters or, you know. Apparently, hours. but they're putting satellites up too. So there's something wrong in Oz. Like uh, how, mm. how are the satellites working at those distances? Yeah, it must have a lot more power behind that signal. I would imagine it would have to be a little more powerful than the Bluetooth, uh, <laughs> those, those little devices you hook into the network. Anyway, now. yeah. Well, the thing is, there's, there's obviously some misinformation, uh, which is you know, not surprising. So, um, I think but, it's purposeful because when, they, when they're doing things like this and they don't want the public to know about it, they're, 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 
their opportunity and advantage grows by taking out certain pieces of information that would otherwise make it logical and reasonable and make sense. So they take out those pieces of information and then people like us are like, wait a minute, there's a piece of information missing here. What might go here? And then we're looking to fill that in. And then that's where people are like, oh, you guys are hypothesizing. It's like, well, you guys aren't giving us full disclosure. So that's, that's like the, it's a causality thing. Yeah. And they're taking the action that starts the, the scrutiny because there's pieces of information that we would need. Like if, if they have tested this and it's all good and it doesn't have any adverse effects on human beings, especially children or the elderly or people in close proximity to these devices, then let's just be clear and transparent and they shouldn't have to hide it. But the fact that they go about hiding it tells me not only is it wrong, but they know it's wrong. And that's why they choose to do it very implicitly. Like you said, they didn't send us an offer. They're just basically like saying, well, you've heard about it. So you must agree because you haven't said yes. And then, you know, I want these requirements right. <laughs> as your way of saying no. Exactly. And that's, that's the whole key. So it's, it's quite simple. Um, I mean, it's complex, but it's simple in its, uh, in the approach. Like if you understand just the simplicity of it, uh, that, that you just have to say yes, you have to say no in the right way or, or yes with a condition on it. And um, it changes everything because that's how they're doing it. They're doing everything in Lex Mercatoria and it's done by offer or claim and nobody comes with a superior claim. All right. So let's, let's nail this down then. So when you're speaking at red pill next month, uh, don't spoil your presentation, but give us a little preview on what exactly you're going to be informing the audience about. Well, most people uh, <clears throat> don't understand the jurisdiction, um, uh, hierarchy. So uh, I get a lot of comments that that's what people um, really liked about the presentation they've seen on, on online. So I'll, I'll do that and I'll go a little deeper with that. And, um, you know, I can talk about some of the things we, we talked about today. And, um, but the jurisdiction, you have to see it in order to understand that there's this thing going on. Because we've been told certain things which, which keeps us in a box but they're operating outside that box and that's the problem. Yeah. So we were running around banging our heads against the inside of this box and they're like, oh, it sucks to be you, you know, and that kind of thing. So, um, but so once you, once you see it and, and the more people that can see this, um, you'll see how fragile it is. It's like the wizard of Oz story where the curtain, you know, um, even when the curtain first, you know, the dog kind of pulls the curtain and you can see the guy talking in the mic and he closes the curtain. Yeah, don't pay attention to that man, you know, behind the curtain, look at me, the big, you know, it's, yeah. it, it's the same kind of thing. So people kind of got to get a little bit jogged out and then go, oh, wow, this is a joke. And, um, you know, it, it means serious re repercussions, but when you understand the simplicity of um, Lex Mercatoria and contracts, just a simple contract, it's very powerful once you understand that's what they're doing to you and you can have a very simple um, response to that that puts you in the driver's seat of the thing. And there's nothing they can do about it because they started it. And we had a lawyer in, in Seattle, you know, writing on behalf of Attorney General on the governor and whatever, like I, I don't get impressed by all these logos and lawyers and <clears throat> all that stuff. Seen way too many of them. And um, so he's, he had all this case law of, you gotta have a meeting of the minds in the, in the, in the court. You can't have a tacit agreement, a contract that doesn't exist. And I went, you are the ones that are doing the tacit agreement contract. And this is a counter offer, which is the meeting of the minds on your tacit agreement contract. So they Broke tried that. to sell you on their idea and you knew enough not to buy it. I think he didn't know until I pointed it out. That's my gut feeling. And he went, oh my God. And he wrote back, says, uh, can we have a private meeting? I said, no, we can't. <laughs> How did, it feel? How did it feel to be able to say no to that thing you didn't want to do? What's that? 
How did it feel to say no to that meeting, that thing you didn't want to do? Because a lot of people would feel obligated to say yes. Here's the problem. He, in the, inside the body of the letter, we are not going to change our position. To blah, 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 blah. And then further down, we'd like to have a meeting. I said, well, you just said you're not going to change your position. So what is the point in having a meeting? I respectfully decline. <laughs> Go away. If you're not going to change your mind, what, what, why are we having meetings? So you can suss out who's doing this and uh, like, no. You just said you're not going to change your position. There's no negotiating. So no, we're not having a meeting. And it felt really good to, to you know, because obviously he's some kind of lawyer, you know, if you're writing on behalf of the governor and all you know, that type of echelon, you're, you're a, you're a guy. And of course these get CC to everybody. Right. So yeah, we got our high powered. Powered. David versus Goliath because they have a lot invested in their law school education and they're getting paid a big salary. Yeah. And here's this guy who just put together, oh, this is how it works. And he's sending letters back and forth and it's just as effective, more effective. Jeez, more effective. Because I've seen it a, a few times, especially on the high powered lawyers, they get out of the way and um, they don't, uh, they have a lot to lose. And if they're held personally liable and that gets back to the, you know, this notice of liability concept, I think there's something to it. Plus, what they, they lose face. Here's what, here's what happens. Like, we send these documents out to certain people. And that what first thing they do, I got to give this to my lawyer because I don't understand this. The lawyer goes, I think it's bunk. Okay. Feel really good. Lawyers. Yeah, lawyers are on top of this. Lawyer says it's bunk. Trojan, it's the Trojan and horse is empty. The Trojan horse is empty. Let it go through. Because <laughs> then they let it go through, right? And you keep sending Trojan horses until one day. The lawyer steps down and the people are like, whoa, may, may, uh, I'm not feeling the love on this. Or they go and get advice somewhere else, right? And somebody else goes, you know, further up one of the secret societies. Uh, yeah, that. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's real, dude. <laughs> what well my, my lawyer mm, well lawyer's not really in the club that like we're in and yeah that you got to do something with that and so what we've seen people do these knee-jerk reactions and and one guy on the school board on the vaccination went um put it through to risk management after the high-powered lawyer and she was really good like one of the best lawyers i've actually she wasn't using templates she was actually you know she was still on the BS side, but she was very good at it. And um, trying to reach, you know, cause at the same time, when they respond, they have to send the, the CC their client, right? So they, the client always sees the interaction. And so the letter goes out, it feels really strong. And then the people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, my lawyers got that. And then the response comes back and they see a copy of that too. And it's like, whoa. And, um, and it's always simple, like just, you know, layman, not layman, but, you know, just not a big drawn out thing. It's like bang, bang, bang. And um, so then the people start and they can tell their lawyer is not feeling the love or whatever. Who knows what goes on behind, you know, closed doors and telephone calls, et cetera. But they start to feel uneasy. You can feel it. And um, they start making reactions, either quitting their job or um, and one guy in particular, somebody put the document through to risk management. Can you pay this? And so the lawyer, after going, there is no merit in what you're doing, you know, in all these letters, somebody went, I think this is real. I need, I need risk management to pay this. So it's she's not worth like, the risk. Yeah. So, so she, uh, she quit. And then a new lawyer, oh, all correspondence has to come to me. I'm like, Oh yeah, well, seen this before. So the lawyer like got out of the way or got fired, like, well, who knows, but they're gone anyway. A new lawyer steps in, the risk management um, rejects it, sends it to the claimant, says your claim, but he didn't put the claim in, somebody else did. So somebody wasn't feeling the love. <laughs> no matter what their lawyer, uh, the lawyer was saying, you know, there's no basis on law for it. Don't worry about this, this is bunk. Uh, he made a decision or he, she, he or she made a decision to, to put it through risk management because found out their own information or whatever. So these are the types of things that, that, that we're causing. And if we can, if we can um, make that happen on a large scale, it will 
the results will happen on a larger scale as well. And then one thing will lead to the other. So um, they can't replace people faster than we can get them out if we, if we can move fast enough on a larger scale. Well, and to that end, uh, the InPower movement, you guys have created a, a downloadable PDF that people can use in the 5G situation. My understanding is it'll soon be updated for the vaccine question, uh, you know, about whether or not you own your own body. And because uh, that's the same tactic that can be applied to these various situations where people don't feel that they have any power. And now they can at least stand their ground, not be aggressive, but not be aggressed upon anymore because they yeah. have newfound knowledge. Yeah, because they because they've turned us all into merchants and and this you know fictitious person, that's what they're moving against. That's what's getting the vaccination, and you just are volunteering to go through the motions of it. So that's how they're justifying it in their weird way, right? So it's still commercial and still by agreement, and so you just have to do commercial process on all these things. So we don't have the five G one up yet. Uh, we're hoping to have it by red pill, but uh, it'll be shortly after. We will have the smart meter one up. We're doing smart meter in the UK, and we will have smart meter going in Australia and New Zealand shortly after that. And um, the vaccine one is ready. We just got to get it um, cleaned up a little bit. And then we're working on a uh, way to semi-automate these things as well. So from round to round, the information will fill into fields, so you don't have to keep track and it'll do your calculations for you and all that kind of stuff. So to keep these things accurate, because there's a lot of clerical errors that happen, which aren't the end of the world, but it is just uh, time consuming. And, you know, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot to what we're doing. And um, a lot of it, I don't, you know, discuss too much publicly, but um, we are amassing um, wealth in their system as well these documents have value and the value is um, what's written on them and or the market value of somebody was to buy them or, um, uh, you know, and pay fiat dollars for them or whatever. So, but this is, these are the types of documents. And I think you alluded to, they're running out of um, dead instruments and we're creating tons of them. Well, and I think you also mentioned at one point in one of the interviews I reviewed in doing my homework for this one, that um, these guys on the other side, they only have about 10 different moves. And once you understand the, the, the grammar, the, 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 the various moves they can make, just like learning how to play chess, right? Once you learn that, then you're not surprised anymore when uh, the lawyer or the judge makes a move. You're like, oh, he's, he's going with that, so I'm going to counter with this. And you've got strategies worked out now, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so when I was in court, you know, I, because of my, my case was always called last, I sat through a lot of cases and, and you start to see patterns. Like you said, it, it, it's like, yeah, 10 different things and a couple of variations on those, you know, on a couple of them. And, you know, you can see it coming and oh, they're setting up for this one. Oh, there it is. You know, like, and uh, so it, it becomes really uh, a bit of a joke. And um, for those that can see it and, uh, so yeah, they, they don't, they're not overly uh, creative. They're highly intelligent, but they're psychopathic and they're not overly creative. And uh, so they keep doing the same things over and over. But that said, the same things have traditionally worked as well, right? So there's a bit of a problem on our end because we keep buying the same, same poo and thinking it's going to be something different. Well, I think it's and, about um, more just embodying like the porcupine strategy of defense and it's like not all the other animals are going to be porcupines but at least you can be if you learn how to outgrow the status quo fill in the blanks and learn how to take actions and improve and, and you know continue to unfold yeah. your consciousness but you know and, uh, and i have no fear of anything but you know at, we're at a stage now where um even being a porcupine if they get if they were to get this 5g thing up um, it wouldn't matter. So um, we have to actually make more people porcupines or something's got to change. Like we have to have a, uh, we can't just go, uh, you know, it's working for me in my little spot. No, here. That's a good point. That's a good point. You're right. Cause uh, 5g and the technocracy of which it is part 
Uh, it's the use of cybernetics and information collection to surveil people to predict their actions and the purpose is government to control their actions. Right. right? Yeah. And so th this is all ties in with trying to, you know, overthrow God, you know, at, at the, at the core. So this, we're in a situation where we have to kind of wake up to who we are and what our um, contractual uh, position is and exercise it and be it and um, not, not buy into the rhetoric and the, and the claims um, that are out there. Because the, uh, I'm telling you, they, they, it's amazing what they've been able to accomplish, but it's extremely fragile. It's like a house of cards and all it takes is pull that one out and the thing's gone. Like it's that bad. Because it's all based on deception and as soon as that deception is gone, well, now what do you got? Nothing. They have no legal lawful basis for any of their claims. Like they got nothing. And they just need to be called out on it. Just like the New York times need to be inquired as to their claim in that headline and the article from yesterday, I would think that's a good empower and or take back your power group project outline what that letter might look like and get some people to send it in. I know there's people in my, my student body and autonomy class that are going to be interested in how that letter might be structured. And uh, once you learn that technique, you can probably find other useful ways to implement it in your life. It's a good homework assignment. It is. So <laughs> at Red Pill, yeah, at Red Pill, uh, you're going to be helping people stop, participate unwittingly in processes that take away their power. And by learning how to recognize those processes and separating themselves from it, uh, that is a step in the light direction. That is yeah. something that is very valuable. And before they hear you and, and see your presentation, because you're right, I've seen parts of it. You do need the visuals to explain to people how these different layers of law interact with each other. And it's all about reframing the conversation to outside the jurisdiction of whoever you're conversing with. Basically, unless you're conversing with the creator of the universe, him or herself, there are ways to reframe the jurisdiction. And that's what I've also heard uh, in Michael Baderick's techniques on how he, you know, interacts with people at various levels of, of that so-called authority and talks them through it very patiently and purposefully and politely in such a way that you don't get tased or shot or dead. Yeah, exactly. So, and I, I think, I think there comes a point, and I've had, uh, I was on a call last week, and there was a caller that called in, and he's had, you know, some experience as well, and and it comes to the point, like, he got pulled over, he doesn't have a license, and, or, or anyway, he's missing some stuff along those lines, and, you know, the, the officer asks for registration and license, and he goes, well, I've got this piece of paper, whatever this is, and I've got this card thing that I, you know, so he won't call it what it is, and, and therefore he doesn't give it any, um, he doesn't allow it into the reality. It's not used as joinder in that situation. So you yeah. can say, I have this card that shows I can operate a motor vehicle, but this is not my identification. Well, you don't even have to, be, like at a certain point, you don't even have to deal with that. Like I don't even have one. So when yeah. I, if I'm asked, I just go, I don't have one. What do you mean don't have one? Well, I don't have one. What, it, oh, it's expired? No, I don't have one. Oh, are you under suspension? Oh, I'm going to ask you, you know, they get all aggressive because of why don't you have one? I, I just don't have it. I like, I let it go and it's, and I rescinded it. I don't want it and I don't have one. So once they get through their, you know, mine, and if I do give them my name, then they can go back on their, their thing. And, you know, this was going back a few years, this would be the experience. And, um, uh, you know, they phone in my name and, Somebody would talk in their ear and they, okay, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, just carry on. But it's to the point now where they don't even ask my name and I don't think they know who I am as I'm not that recognizable, like in the, in the real scheme of things, I'm not that big of a deal. But it's, it's at the point where that's not the droid you're looking for. It, it's, it's this weird thing, like you go, you go through. Yeah, you're not a potential customer. You're not the low-hanging fruit that they're looking for. They're looking for that 99%, not the 1% that questions the process. But, I, but I'm not questioning anything. Like, this is the thing. Like, it's, it's at a stage where it doesn't even, it doesn't come into my reality. 
like they're not allowed in my reality. It's like, it, it's, it's kind of like that. I don't, and I'm not sure how I did it. It's just, that's what I'm experiencing now where it's like, I see the police and I'm like, okay, whatever. Don't really care. Go. Cool. Yeah, you've lost okay. the fear and I'm sure they're attracted. Predators are attracted to fear. They can smell fear. Some of them. Yeah. You know, so what you're saying is since you're not emitting the odor that they're seeking to prey on, uh, they're not seeing you as a potential target. I had a, a, a really extreme experience uh, last November. I don't know if you have time, but, but uh, this confirmed um, that there's something going on, like I'm cloaked or whatever. I, I, like it, it just, and so I'm, I'm the scientific trial and error type person, right? That's just who I am. I'm not, um, I'm pretty grounded and, and, you know, I have a hard time believing that there's something like that going on, but you know, as you see it more and more, and then when it becomes extreme, then you go, okay, no, there's something going on. I don't, I don't fully understand it, but I know it's actually happening. It's not a, this isn't coincidence. And so um, there is, I think as you move through things, um, and the NOL, like the notice of liability helps people, the more you read it and the more you interact with it, the more something happens on the inside of you and you become something, like you move up move you change yeah you become less subjugated and more autonomous yes and it's happening in a in a just an organic way it's not there's nothing it's not by design or there's no course they're just reading it and something happens and and that's 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 what people are saying like that's what i'm hearing back from them like cal i read this thing 20 times and i'm different what do you mean you're different I, like I, everything's changed. I go like, yeah, what? it's under, understanding. Like learning's a psychedelic. It's mind expanding. You're not the same person after you've learned it than you were before you learned such things. Right? Exactly. And it, so but it's, it's like not just. Re, but it's not just reading it. Like reading it once or twice. It's the guys that read it. Uh, you know, one guy said I read it twelve times. Another guy said it, I read it twenty times. So there's something that happens with the repetition. That they see because there's certain things in there and I know they're there um, that um, are, are separated for, on purpose. So I say certain things here and then I can do things here. But if you didn't, if you forgot that bit, then this thing is going to bite you in the butt, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I've learned from them. That's how they do it. So, um, so I think as you read it a few times, you start to remember, Oh, that thing's over there, but Oh, with this clause and that together, they got a huge problem here. And you know, you wouldn't see that by reading it once or twice. You gotta kinda, I've been around it a lot, but there's certain things like that. And I think that really triggers people. I don't know what it is, but there's something about it. I think it's the transformation from thinking in checkers to thinking in chess. Yes. And you're out there acting as a, an informal grandmaster teaching them to play chess. Yeah. And it's, it's just sort of happening on its own. It's not my smarts or my teaching ability or anything like that. It's just, uh, there's a, there's something else going on. And uh, I'll have, I'll say it here. The people that have had that experience are also experiencing, um, keeping their meters power, not being shut off. That's good. These Positive are, mindsets. These are not the droids you're looking for. This is not the house to put the smart meter on. <laughs> yeah. Positive mindsets, prescriptive actions that go along with that, and uh, uh, potential goals that have prodigious effects. Cal, I look forward to meeting you at the uh, Red Pill Conference. I think we do the, uh, the VIP dinner Friday night, so I'll probably get to see you there. I don't know what day you're flying in. I'm but, flying uh, Thursday. I'm coming in Thursday. All right. So we got a lot of people coming in Thursday. So maybe we'll run into each other over there at the hotel because I got to drop off some guests. But uh, really looking forward to it and uh, safe travels to America. And um, I'm looking forward to all the audience at the Red Pill getting exposed to uh, a real Red Pill issue, that which is law. And when you learn how to, uh, to leverage it, it's no longer as easily leveraged against you. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts for, for the audience today, Cal? Um, just why are we the only species 
that pays to live here. Just think about it and see where that, you know, see what answers you come up with. <laughs> right on. Profound words from Cal Washington for everybody watching. Uh, check out that New York Times article. Uh, your cell phone, your 5G cell phone, safe for you. Uh, Russians are telling you about that. I'll post it in the link in the notes. And uh, for, uh, for those of you interested in attending the Red Pill, there's also the link for the, uh, the online version of the tickets. You can use a coupon code. It's being held here in Hartford, June 7th through 9th. And for those of you attending, I will see you there. Thank you for tuning in and not dropping out. Nice.